I'm Josh Green. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to the Dow, if you want to see a real bear market in action, just check out Scott Walker's poll numbers. Boom! He's nuts. I'll, I'll factor in. All right. Happy National Waffle Day, sports fans. In our lineup tonight, a Joe, a Jeb, and a Donald. But first, another Joe. The Washington Post reports that Vice President Biden is inviting major Democratic fundraisers to his home after Labor Day to talk about the big 2016 question. He also met with Senator Elizabeth Warren over the weekend. But the buried lead is that Biden has moved his deadline to decide about running to late September slash early October. That's about a month later than he originally planned. Josh, my question for you, the Biden people are saying, hey, you know, this really depends on whether we can put together a campaign at this late date. My question is whether that's the real thing he's looking at or whether he's really looking more at the potential unraveling of Hillary Clinton's candidacy. No, I don't think so. We've known for, what, 20 odd years that Joe Biden desperately wants to be president. He's tried. He's tried again. But the real factor in the race is, is Clinton too powerful a force to present some kind of a course to victory. The longer he waits, the harder it gets. And already, even amidst all these Biden trial balloons, you have anonymous advisors saying, geez, you know, we hope he doesn't do it. He's going to embarrass himself. I think ultimately, Clinton's strength, even with the email controversy, is going to dissuade him from running. But I think it all really comes down to Hillary. There's nothing I like better than to be in the disagreement zone with you, Josh. I think that a huge factor right now is that the people around Biden who do want him to run, there are others, no doubt, who are uh, wary that he would get into this race and get slaughtered, and they don't want to see him end his career that way. But among those who want to enable him to get in, they are telling him now, and that includes some people very close to him, look, this thing is moving in your direction. She is having problems. The establishment is getting close to panic mode. If this email thing gets worse, as it, at the pace at which it's been getting worse, you could see her candidacy on the brink of unraveling by the end of September. So don't go out there and push it. Wait back, see what's going on. That's what the delay of this month is, to see how bad off she is come late September. You'll be sad to know that I actually don't disagree with that. I think there's nothing wrong with putting in place a campaign in the event that she collapses. But again, going back to my original point, it's all dependent on Hillary. If she bottoms out, he is not going to be dissuaded from running because he can't get campaign manager X oh, I over agree campaign this manager is, Y. This is one place we agree. I think Biden thinks that the campaign apparatus stuff, I think he might be wrong about this, but that the apparatus would take care of itself in the event of a Clinton collapse. But I think there is a lot of now in Biden world, it's kind of, it's all eyes on Hillary. If they, they, they recognize she's more vulnerable now than she's been for a long time. And as more people start to call him and encourage him to run, he just wants to see whether she reaches the tipping point where it's, there's an opening there that's too wide for him to resist. Well, and I think the key block of bedwetters, too, are these fundraisers who he's going to have up to his house who are most nervous at all about Hillary's prospects. I like it any time we get to say bedwetters on this show. Okay. While we wait for the Democratic primary to maybe get interesting, let's go to the primary that's wildly interesting, the primary of Trump. The Republican race is so good that now it's literally come to yo mama insults. This is what Donald Trump put out today on Instagram for former frontrunner Jeb Bush to see. Would you like to see him run? No, I really don't. I think it's a great country. There are a lot of great families. There are, just, there are other people out there that are very qualified, and we've had enough Bushes. So that was uh, Donald Trump trolling Jeb Bush with his own mother. This afternoon, Bush, down in McAllen, Texas, for a border security event, sort of fired back. Take a look. The simple fact is that his proposal is unrealistic. It will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. It will violate people's civil liberties. It will create friction with our third largest trading partner that's not necessary. And I think he's wrong about this. That's Jeb talking about uh, Trump's proposal to build a wall, Josh. Um, this whole Republican race right now, everybody has, everything has fallen away. It's all about Jeb and Donald, right? They are just, they're trading volleys back and forth on a daily basis. My question to you uh, about Jeb, does he have a strategy now to deal with Donald Trump? And if he has one, can you please tell me what it is? It's not clear to me that he does. I mean, up until a week or so ago, the strategy was ignore him, uh, make an example simply by being a contrast and being responsible. And then a few days ago, it all changed up. And now he's attacking Trump and you have his advisor or his, his funders wanting him to attack Trump and uh, Mike Murphy, his super PAC chief saying, you know, we're not going to spend money on that. It, it seems like chaos 
and the fact that he went down to Texas to the border and wrapped his arm around the immigration debate says to me that he's really worried about Donald Trump and the momentum that he's gotten on this issue. They claim this event has been scheduled for weeks, but there is, I think, a very clear, maybe not to be ultimately successful, but a very clear strategy. They want to, A, attack Trump as a liberal, as a closet Democrat, and say Jeb Bush is the real conservative. They want to show Jeb Bush is feisty, that he's willing to fight back. Uh, they want to take on the bully. They want to be seen as that. And fourth, the key little thing that's going on here under the radar is the notion that they believe Marco Rubio supporters, John Kasich supporters, are starting to get restive over the fact that they're not seeing their candidates taking on Trump, and they think they can peel away some of those Rubio and Kasich voters if Trump, uh, if Jeb acts tough publicly like this. Yeah, I'm skeptical. I mean, the, the, the Trump attack on Jeb, that he's a, what do you call him, a low-energy guy, I, I think it's, it's, it's fundamentally he's the, accurate. He's the low-T candidate. The low, he's the low-T candidate. The low-T candidate. There are pills for that, but, <laughs> but Jeb's not taking them. So, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> All right, move on. Here's the latest sign that the Donald is a force field of otherworldly energy that absorbs anything you fire at it and converts it into fuel. A Reuters Ipsos poll has him at 32%, exactly twice as much as Jeb T, the low energy candidate, and everyone else falls into a lower tier of single digits. And check out this New York Times analysis. Trump is leading Cruz among Tea Partiers, Mike Huckabee among evangelicals, and Jeb Bush among moderates. John, is the summer of Trump worse for establishment Republicans or grassroots Republicans? And bonus question, which single person is getting the worst of it? Uh, you know, well, first of all, Trump is a, apparently, uh, uh, he contains multitudes. He's a big tent. He's appealing across, somehow across the ideological spectrum on the basis of the force of his personality. I think the conventional wisdom has been that it's the, the candidates in the, 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 the grassroots lane, the Ted Cruz's of the world, the Mike Huckabee's of the world, not being able to get air. Those are Trump voters. But now we see that Trump's voters are all over the map. And I think you really, the people who are getting hurt most, Scott Walker, Marco Rubio, two guys who used to be top tier candidates. Now they are no longer in the top tier. Their fundraising seems to be suffering. Uh, you hear around New York City a lot of donors who were interested in those guys, who have looked at and seen the way that they've crumbled in the face of Trump, and they're like, I'm not going to write a check to Marco Rubio, Scott Walker now. Don't disagree. I've got two other candidates. So I think the big loser here is Chris Christie. Chris Christie was already losing, but all of the oxygen and the whole character type of the bombastic, tell it like it is, bigger than life Republican. Not politically correct. Not politically correct has been completely subsumed by Donald Trump. Christie is a forgotten guy in danger of falling out of the grown-up debates. The other guy I think this hurts is Jeb Bush. Yes, he is the counterpoint to Jeb, but Jeb's whole strategy as the Republican nominee was to be the grown-up who was going to modernize the right. party, right. broaden the appeal to Latinos and young people, and no matter what happens, I think that's been shot to pieces. And if he does win the, Democrat or the Republican nomination, he's still going to have more trouble than he would have, thanks to Donald Trump and what he's accomplished. Well, we'll see. I think those guys are pretty happy with the idea of a one-on-one -on -one Trump uh, Bush debate down the line, that if Bush can be the establishment candidate, Trump can be the anti-establishment candidate. They are pretty confident that Jeb Bush has the resources and the organization nationally to be able to win that battle. I will say another person not in the establishment lane who I think has been hurt, not so much some of the others I mentioned. I think Ted Cruz, you know, he, his strategy right now, which seems to be, uh, hey, you know, I'm going to save my money. I'm not going to say anything about, uh, about Donald Trump. I'm going to sit back. And when Trump eventually crumbles, those voters will come to me. Uh, that's a brilliant strategy on paper. It just doesn't work if cr Trump doesn't crumble for a long time. Maybe. I don't know. He doesn't know. <laughs> All right. Coming up, former Attorney General Michael Mukasey. We will Mukasey what he has to say about Hillary Clinton's email server right after these words from our sponsors. Our guest tonight is former George W. Bush Attorney General and current Jeb Bush advisor, Michael Mukasey. Mr. Attorney General, thanks for coming on the show. Good to be um, here. You wrote a, an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal. We're going to spend a bunch of time talking about that today related to Hillary Clinton and her email practices. But you have come under some criticism uh, but from uh, defenders of Secretary Clinton in recent days who are upset about the notion that no one is pointing out that you have not identified yourself as an advisor to Jeb Bush. So I just want to get that out of the way. I don't know how much time you've spent with Jeb Bush. And I just want to answer, answer the question to the extent that uh, the, how does that affect the way in which you view her situation? Not at all. Um, I haven't spent a whole lot of time with, with Governor Bush. And the way that 
column came to be written is I got an email from an editor at the Wall Street Journal asking me if I'd been following the story, who hasn't, um, and whether I was interested in writing anything, and I did. Didn't right. check with anybody on the Bush campaign. Right. Haven't spoken to anybody on the Bush campaign in months. In months. So, right. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you for getting that out of the way. Um, the op-ed has, has, is, two, is a two-part op-ed, um, basically, and I, I think for a lot of people who read it and a lot of people still don't know what we're talking about. You basically went through in a relatively uh, careful way and talked about the various areas where sh uh, Secretary Clinton might be in some legal jeopardy and then talked about some common sense related issues uh, that might be objections raised to her practices. The, the things in the legal area, one related to keeping classified material in an unclassified location, another to potentially destroying public records, another to the Espionage Act and gross negli grossly negligent loss or destruction of information related to national defense, and finally the destruction of any record, document, or tangible object with intent to impede or obstruct investigations or justice. Right. Of those four areas, I mean, we could spend all day talking about all four, which of those do you think poses not the most severe legal uh, penalties, but which do you think, on the basis of what we know now, is where she is in greatest jeopardy? I think the, the misdemeanor, which is the same one that was used uh, with respect to General Petraeus, the same one that was used uh, with respect to uh, John Deutsch, uh, that is keeping classified material in an unsecure location. That's, that's, that's the easiest. It also the, has the most minor penalties. It's a misdemeanor. Right. It's not a felony. The one that actually presents an odd sort of risk for her is the one involving destruction of government documents by somebody who was their custodian. That carries a, a, that's a felony, it carries a three-year penalty, but it also carries a permanent disqualification from holding any further office, which is kind of odd. Um, and that, I mean, since she's obviously running for another office, that would present a certain problem. And that relates to destruction of not just a classified material or potential class, but to any government document. Any government record. If right. you are the custodian of records, you destroy those records, then... Right. Theoretically, you face prosecution. And presumably, the only way in which she would be in trouble for that is if, among the 30,000 or so emails that she destroyed, um, though there were some government documents in that, in that cache of emails. Yes. Which we do not, at this point, know. We, the Clinton campaign, oh, well, uh, they've, they've indicated that there are government documents um, among those. Among those. Um, I think they unearthed a couple of hundred documents that were, that were among those. I don't know whether anybody would prosecute her under that statute. That's a, that's a whole different thing. So the Clinton campaign has offered several rebuttals to this scandal, and we wanted to tick through a couple of them and ask you after each one, does this matter? Uh, so first of all, the claim that she did not send classified information, if it was received, it was not marked classified. <laughs> the, the, the restrictions relate to the information. They don't relate to the markings on the information. And if you're the Secretary of State, then what you get is the most sensitive, the most confidential stuff, because otherwise it doesn't make its way to you. So, but, but, if, could, it's, but, if, it's, but if it's the case that she, she her, she's trying to make a distinction, she's basically trying to say, look, uh, the, the, the things that were sent to me, I had no reason to think they were classified, and I'm not responsible for what comes into my inbox, right? That is, if you were Colin Powell, you had a private email system, and somebody sent you a classified document, you couldn't be responsible for just receiving it. Colin Powell used a, uh, a private um, email system or, or, or uh, yeah, private email service right. uh, only on occasion. A couple, it happened a couple of times. We're not talking about reliance entirely on a private no, email No, I, I understand that, but the point I think they're making is that, is that she can only be responsible for, for email that she sent and whether that was classified or not. Not entirely, because it depends on how you, if you get, you get a piece of classified email on your private server, right. your first obligation is to take it and stick it in a secure location, i.e. on a classified server, tell your IT department about it, and possibly wipe it off your unclassified server. There's no indication she did that. What's, another Clinton rebuttal has been that uh, the secretary only deleted personal emails and had the right to do so. No doubt she had the right to delete personal emails. Um, whether all she deleted were personal emails is obviously open to question since she was the person doing the deleting. Um, it, she deleted, I think, a total of, what, 30,000 mm -hmm. emails, um, which involved Chelsea's wedding and yoga. Those are the examples that she's given. Okay. But, but the question I, does, but it is the case, though, that there's no prohibition against having a personal email address for a, for a cabinet secretary. And right. it is the I case... Didn't, I didn't have one right. for... for for reasons of, of, of care and prudence, prudential reasons. Right. Well, this kind of brings us to the common sense question. I mean, I just, you know, when you first arrived in office as an attorney general, you were 
uh, briefed about the various security standards. Just, right. just talk about, about you, you make a point in, that, in the op-ed about the degree of, of, of reflexive uh, caution that most cabinet secretaries undertake. Talk about that and why you think what she did from the very outset was problematic. You're briefed on the need to keep documents confidential, the need to keep classified information in its proper location and under, under proper conditions. For example, you don't take papers with you um, unless you're carrying them in a locked envelope, unless you're carrying them um, in a vehicle that qualifies as a skiff. Um, I managed to make an arrangement with the FBI, which had an apartment down the hall from mine, that I could look at documents in my apartment because they had a camera trained on the, <laughs> the front door of my apartment. But at the end of the night, I would have to go down the hall, give them the documents, and they would hold on to them. One last question. Uh, as a former attorney general, based on what's now in the public domain, what we know, assuming we don't find out anything new about Clinton, would you be comfortable bringing charges either against Clinton or some member of her staff just based on what we know today? Can't based on what we know today because we don't know what documents were among the government documents that were on her private server. Um, and. You can start with that. We also don't know precisely what she knew about those documents. So, no, I would not, I, based on what we have now, I, you couldn't justify bringing a case. On the other hand, no case has been brought. That's why they conduct investigations. Do you think there's, it's in any way meaningful, this is the last question for you, do you think, that when they, they point out right now, there's been no indication that there is a criminal investigation going on today. Is well, that meaningful in any way? It's not meaningful and it's false. What do you think they're investigating? The, the, the FBI doesn't conduct civil investigations, and they don't investigate. Another, another trope is that they are investigating her email system. They don't investigate machines. They investigate people. And one of the people they're investigating is the former Secretary of State. Right. They're also investigating other members of her staff, obviously, because they, too, were involved in transmitting documents. But it's a criminal investigation. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Michael McKenzie, uh, for coming in. Uh, after the break, we ask our resident financial wizard, Joe Weisenthal, how today's market chaos will affect the political world. And he is going to tell us when we come back. Frankly, I'm the one that says you better start uncoupling from China because China's got problems and they have big problems and they're bringing us down. As the Chinese markets tend to have a correction, which they're doing right now, um, it's going to have an even greater effect because this president doesn't know how to say no to spending, doesn't know how to say no to a bigger and more intrusive government. So what you need to do in the Oval Office is rein this government in. I actually have been expecting a correction for some time. You know, the market has been way too high given the fundamentals. Our economy is not particularly strong. 2% growth is very lackluster. China's economy has been slowing down for some time. Europe's economy is in trouble, so I think this is warranted, honestly. Uh, that was a handful of Republican 2016ers reacting to the market chaos today. We have a different kind of a reaction coming from our second guest tonight, who's making his WADR debut, even though his show ended just 20 minutes ago, and he probably wanted to go home and go to sleep. Joe Weisenthal uh, of The Great Show, what did you miss? Thanks for being here. Um, so uh, Donald Trump blames the Chinese, uh, Carly Fiorina blames the Fed, and Chris Christie blames Barack Obama. Um, who's actually to blame for what's going on in the market right now? I don't know. I actually kind of liked all of their explanations. I mean, the thing about market sell-offs is they, people give all sorts of explanations. So people are like, oh, it started with the Chinese currency devaluation last week, as if like a 2% currency devaluation should really uh, have, you know, cause what we saw. Obviously, there are concerns about growth. There is the Chinese uh, stock market sell-off, which perhaps leads to other market sell-offs. But really, things happen because people move in packs and herds, and people panic, and then people get greedy, and they get fearful. And so the idea of pointing to one thing that caused this is kind of silly. Is there any reason, though, at all? I mean, the, the one that amused me the most was the idea that Obama was somehow, you know, implicit. Scott Walker came out and said we ought to cancel yeah. our state visit to China. Is so, there any rationale? Of all the explanations, that the idea that it has anything to do with Obama definitely seems like the most far-fetched, especially because, you know, all the criticisms of him, you know, you could have made it any time during his presidency, and the stock market has had one of the greatest runs in market history. But, you know, maybe the Fed and the idea that stock markets got over ahead of themselves because investors got used to easy money, that's 
possible that had something to do with it. But no, I think the purely political, it's Obama's fault and you should cancel his state dinner, definitely strikes me as the, uh, the least um, in this world of possibilities. I appreciated your Twitter reaction to the, uh, Scott Walker's calling for that oh, cancellation. Yeah. Just OGs, which seemed to me to kind of express a certain, yeah, just like a certain a, kind of dismay or skepticism about that idea. I would definitely say I was dismayed and I would dismiss it. It just seemed it, quite a reach. I so, would say. so here's the thing, right? We're thinking about politics in the 2016 race and what all this might mean for that, right? Yeah. Consumer confidence matters, the economy matters, especially in terms of what happens to the president's approval rating and what that might mean for Hillary Clinton. Right. Yeah, I saw this story in the Washington Post today that basically looked at the correlation between approval ratings and stock market crashes stock market corrections in the past and shows this really weird thing where presidential approval ratings often go up after major corrections in the market. I, I did not realize that that was true, but there, was, there were charts that suggested that. What would explain that? I mean, it's hard to imagine. You know, I guess there's the phenomenon that people like presidents when it, during chaos in general or turmoil and they rally around the president. I guess that's possible. I think obviously, you know, as going into 2016, the real economy is going to be a much bigger story than the stock market itself. And I don't think that's one of the interesting things about this market. You know, in the past when we've had these sell-offs, they're usually accompanied by growth scares or something like that. The economy seems fine. Housing is picking up. Commodities are getting, getting cheaper, which will pass through eventually in the form of lower gas prices. The labor market continues to get tighter. Not phenomenal wage growth, but there's still signs that that's picking up. So I think is, if those trends are going in the right direction, that's far more important than what happens. But Joe, if you were a Republican presidential candidate, you know, your staffers are huddling around you today. You, you got, you're expected to come up with some sort of answer or solution or policy that you as president you know, could do to kind of change the global situation. Is there anything a U.S. president could do to have a meaningful effect on the type of uh, financial earthquake we saw today? I mean, you know, in my dream world and in a world where the president and Congress could work together and uh, fiscal spending dream so world that, indeed. The, you know, in my dream world, all the burden wouldn't have been wouldn't have been placed on the Federal Reserve to ease policy through <laughs> QE. And it would have been more of a mix of monetary policy and fiscal spending. That world is not does not exist. It probably won't exist for a long time. It certainly won't exist any time in the future. So, sure, that would be good. But other than that. I'd like, I'd like to spend some time thinking about what it would be like to live in Joe Weisenthal's dream world. Um, <laughs> but for now, we'll be right back with some very critical news about these nuts after this. The not totally real presidential candidate and my boy D's Nuts has released his coveted endorsements for the Democratic and nominated, the Republican nominating contest. So congratulations to Bernie Sanders and John Kasich. Those are two candidates who can rely on D's Nuts. Until tomorrow, for me and Josh Green, sayonara. <laughs>